welcome to 15 to 15. Episode 9. Is it really episode 9? Already. Okay. Well, I'm going to focus on two extremely important words in my intellectual and professional career. When I graduated from the high college and then graduate school, the key word was English. I was an English major, so I would get jobs as English teacher. However, through the passage of time, two other words emerged with great significance. Those are humanities and general education became the key words. And I had the opportunity at United Tribes to actually teach a course for many years called Introduction to Humanities. Now, normally you wouldn't have an introduction to humanities. You would have maybe a, an American literature course that would count as humanities, or a history class. It would count as a humanities. Or history of painting, history of art could count as a humanities class. Philosophy would be called it. But my, for some reason, our, the course was called Intro to Humanities, which meant that I was teaching a course which was not spec specifically in my field like literature, but it was a range of subjects. I feel that the solutions I came up with, the things, are absolutely brilliant in affirming humanities as an important discipline in colleges and in the academic world, along with the sciences, the social sciences, uh, things like that. Mm. And because it was a general ed course, it was a clarification of the importance of general ed in the academic world. And I can make a case for this, and I think what I did was quite interesting. I want, so I'm going to show you the way I was teaching my humanities class over more, many years. Okay. This was the textbook, Adventures of the Human Spirit. And if you'd like, you're going to have a task to do eventually. Why don't you thumb through it just for 30 seconds, browse through it, because I'm going to have you make a selection eventually. <clears throat> On the very first day of class, I would give them a definition of humanities, which I knew that they had, they were wondering, what is this class? They had never heard of it either. And uh, so I would give them something of a definition and then go through a kind of exercise with them. <clears throat> and I would have them browse through the book as they get used to the book itself. And then I will make some clarification. <clears throat> Okay. Then I would give them this is basically a definition of what happens in a humanities class. And I would take this on any road show, any promotion, academic council uh, thing. In the humanities, we think about, we study, analyze, and research the arts, human culture, and history. So in this class, we're going to have various experiences with the arts, human culture, and history. And we might think about them, for example, in the way we saw a film last night called The 36th Chamber of Shaolin. We're watching a movie, but then we started the process of thinking about it, just a very modest way. <clears throat> so then I would say that when we do this studying, analyzing, researching, and um, thinking about these three things, let's focus on human beings make art. Human beings make culture, they innovate something in culture, and then it develops. And we have history, and we try to understand questions like, what happened? How do we know that it happened? Why did it happen? What were its consequences? What debates are about a historical event? And we all do this to some extent. Now, to help us along with this, <clears throat> I took a page from this book in the opening chapter, which I found useful, even though it's not the final word. 
the author of this book, Mr. Bishop, divides these humanities disciplines between two things. He calls modes of expression and modes of reflection. And he's trying to create some kind of order so the student isn't overwhelmed by the fact that there are, what is this all about? Under the modes of expression, and then I would have them look at this, memorize the list, copy it, are what we call arts. He's saying that human beings express themselves through the arts. And here is a list of the arts. We make pictures. We make sculptures. We write literature that is lit art out of, made out of words. That includes poetry, different, narrative, storytelling, epic novels, the short story and others. We make music, we dance, we create theater, film, and we create architecture, building, design buildings that have both a form, but they're always meant to be beautiful and attractive also. So he was trying to get clear that human beings express themselves through the arts, and we're obviously going to do something with that. Then he says there are modes of reflection, just to clarify, and modes of reflection are a way of thinking. You don't necessarily produce a painting or a piece of music, but you're, you come up with ideas. For example, philosophy would fall under mode of reflection. It's a way of thinking. Archaeology is the study of the past by excavating objects that human beings leave behind and then interpreting them. You don't just dig, but you have to think about, well, what is this piece of pottery, for example? History, the study of the past, and it, you ask questions like, what happened? How do we know it happened? Why did it happen? What were the consequences? Things like that. And then the comparative study of religion. The other day, when we look at Ninian Smart's book, of seven different aspects of religion that a, a comparative religion scholar would look at. Maybe art of this culture or the uh, belief systems or rituals and things like that. <clears throat> so then, <clears throat> another thing I would have them do, I would say all cultural experiences are relevant in this class. So, but I'm going to focus on four that we're going to keep coming up with. One I call classical culture, and that would be things from the past that some people think are great. So if I say the name Beethoven, Rembrandt, and Shakespeare, that's a classical kind of thing. And it, number two, there's a world of contemporary art since the, the modern era of 20th century, and this whole this book is very good on 20th century and even absolutely contemporary people right at this moment. And I use Picasso and my son Jeremiah Polachek as a good example of these people who are making artistic works that may be challenging and difficult for people. Then we're going to include popular culture. And that is a whole realm of, of uh, popular, uh, let's say, rock and roll, popular music, uh, films, uh, things like that. They don't really fit into these other, but they are works of art. So I say, if you're going to refer to Frozen, for example, you don't have to be embarrassed about it. It's just as interesting to me as these other things, and it's worth thinking about. And even though I don't feel qualified to teach a popular culture class, because I'm not a popular culture scholar. And then we're going to spend time on Native American cultural expression, both something from the past and then things that are contemporary. So I, would ha I want you to memorize this list and this and see that there's a tremendous range of artistic experiences that we can talk about. We can study them, analyze, and research them. So one of the other, th how much time Six we have? Six minutes. Okay. Then I would have them, one person, choose a picture from this book. Would okay. you choose a picture from the book? I'll give you 30 seconds. Choose something that's... Ooh. Uh, New descending staircase. Is that, is that what you want? Yeah. Okay. F fine. This is a wonderful book, actually, for modern stuff. So I'd have one, I'd tell one person, I want you to choose. Don't choose a map. Choose something that's kind of easy to see, but it's big enough on the page. And, I, and then, then I would say, okay, now, then I had this form. Experiencing a picture. And we would do this on the very first day of class, even technically before we did this. I just wanted them to have this experience. Now, what I'm going to have us do is this form. And um, 
I'm going to list the page number. This was on page something. The number is 1401. It's the 14th chapter in the first picture in the chapter, okay. Modernism. Now I had, then I'm going to have you participate. We're going to do this together. Okay. The first question is, describe what you're seeing here and try to control yourself. And You don't have to have any ideas about it. We'll worry about that later, thinking about it. But, uh, but you, of course, will you just bring to whoever you are and describe what you're seeing? And you can see that's the okay. question. Okay, go ahead, and I'll so, say something. So it appears to be an oil painting done in a traditional way that's mostly brown. There's an indication of some movement happening from this top to this bottom right-hand side. Mm -hmm. I could get more into uh, Of course, and I'll stop things, you. But yeah. if we're looking just visually, it's a very limited palette. It's not a lot of like bright colors. They're all kind of brownish. Right. And then I would have students record. They would usually be a little puzzled because they want to say, what is this? I'm, I said, just hold off. Just describe what you're seeing if you can as a discipline. So I'm going to say I see sort of chicka 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 shapes down here mm -hmm. and um, I'm seeing a pretty dark area here and I, I see browns light light kind of a, I'm not sure what color that is it's abstract it's not it, representation it seems like a, some kind of abstraction but I'm not sure I, of course I know my, at this time who I, what is going on here but we're describing now, the next thing is initial comment. I want you to make one comment about this, and then I'm going to make a comment about it. It feels like an action is taking place. Okay, very good. And I would have you record that, and then you would share it with the rest of the class. They're hearing each other say these things. I'm going to make a comment that... Um, it does feel like motion of some kind. Now we could make more of those kinds of comments, but uh, we're going right. to, on interest of time. The third thing is we were now going to get ex we're going to get some two minutes extra information. At this point, the class knows nothing. You know a great deal. I know a great deal. Then I'd have them read down here, but I try to control them from reading anything too fast. Because, of course, yeah. I said, I know you're curious. Stop being curious, I say. Just stop it. Oh, Marcel Duchamp, nude descending a staircase, number 2, 1912, oil on canvas. And I'd have a, that is the information that we got. There's a little bit more, but I'm going to stop them. Then we're going to get some additional information. Um, would you would you say some I'm going to act like we have an expert on art in the classroom today would you make some comments about additional information about this picture well Marcel Duchamp is somebody who started as a painter who had <clears throat> painters in his family but who's primarily known as a conceptual artist oh I'm going to record that so that's all the extra information, and I might at this point give something to them. But um, now they're gathering; they've had their. And then in the conclusion, let's say, let's take you and me seriously. A question is raised by this experience that you and I just had today. Something that you genuinely might follow up on. I'm going to give you mine. Okay. I noticed for the first time that this is number two, oh, and I'm not sure what number one is. No, I'm being totally sincere. Yeah, that would be Brian is saying, "What is number one? Is there a number Questions. three? Okay. Uh, my question would be: Can a painting? I believe that many of these paintings were done in like a futuristic style, trying to show movement. Is painting capable of?" Showing that, or a sculpture, or some sort of actual moving object. Better. Since we know Duchamp goes on to make objects. Yes, data things and all that kind of stuff. What was he trying to do with painting? Yeah, thank you. In conclusion, I would like to say that 
this was my way of introducing humanities as falling in the category of arts. If a student is taking a course in rap music at the University of Colorado, it's, why not see it as an art, as a humanities class? And uh, human culture, which could include philosophy, language, religion, ceremony, political systems, and, and they develop over time. And then any study of the past is an attempt at history. And so there, there's a valid reason, there's a really rich reason that people, that humanities are so important, so there's so, the world is so big and so interesting, and it's really important for general ed people, as well as the specialist, to have as much experience of those things as possible. And so if you're taking a general ed course called let's say, intro to archaeology, wow, what a wonderful thing. Hmm? But you can only do it. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Jeremiah Polachek, and I make paintings about these really, um, these, what would, would, would we actually call them? I make paintings that are primarily about the intersection of the technological landscape with our physical bodies. Uh, in the 1992 film The Lawnmower Man, a simple man mows a lawn for a living, and he is introduced to a virtual reality experience which exponentially increases his intellect. He later becomes an actual person living in this universe, and he tries to become a god. As you can see in my painting here, the actual bits and pieces of the body are flying off in all these different types of directions. And it's really difficult to discern what is the actual body here because we're dealing with a digital universe where these elements of the self are kind of exploding into pieces. I also use a lot of different machines in the creation of my paintings, as you can see here. I sometimes use a comb. I've put a paintbrush on a turkey knife and paint brushes on this bobble ball because I like to let machines actually do the painting and give some element of chance into the work. I've also started using a plotter, which you can see here. This is a device where I've attached my paintbrush to a plotter. And this allows me to interpret different types of data. And this type of data can then be, you know, directly transferred into a mark on the painting. Um, a long time ago, in the around 1970s, they actually created a pretty simple system based on an XY axis, and they tried to figure out like when we're going to run out of resources, and they started plotting these graphs, but you can also see these graphs as lines, so we can see that data can also just become lines. Mm. In this painting here, you can see that there's a facial feature area but the facial features are just a biometric map. So this is kind of referencing this technological takeover of our bio, um, biology and our actual facial fingerprints and turning it into something technological. Now, there's always been a really long history between tools and humans and how we use tools. So when we have an advent of a certain type of tool, it changes everything. So millions of years ago it could have been a certain type of stick or a spear and now of course it's telephones and computers and all these sorts of things. So in the movie The Lawnmower Man he goes on to continue um, making using his tool his lawnmower for his livelihood and then his brain actually takes over that tool. His brain can telepathically mow the lawn um, and you can see in this painting here the body is somewhat amorphous and organic. It is a primordial soup of potentiality waiting to be unleashed, and there is little distinction between reality and imagination, and only the remnants of forms are recognizable. So it's almost like the actual body has left the um, flesh a little bit. Um, in addition to painting, I've also experimented with video, sound, wearable webcams, and interactive immersive installations. In this piece, I wore a glove with a webcam attached to it, and the webcam was connected to a projector, which projected images onto my painting while I painted. In this piece, I put a head webcam onto a hat that pointed straight at the person 
who was wearing the hat, and then they were instructed to paint themselves on the canvas which was right behind them. So you can see that where that's projected, the girl's face that's projected behind her, she then has some paints and she's allowed to paint herself there. Over the summer, I worked on a short experimental documentary about the flatness of the North Dakota horizon and was pulling from Agnes Martin in abstraction. I took hundred, hundreds of videos of the horizon and then arranged them into simple strips of color and shape. I find the idea of the horizon quite intriguing since it serves as a border between earth and sky. I started thinking about the history of the horizon in art and began searching for the first examples of it in painting and drawing. And I asked Elbert Elhadev where that would be. He wasn't quite sure. So I ended up asking online and they said it was probably Minoan. So I just believed them and that was a picture of a Minoan landscape. Mm. Um, these landscapes that I've created um, with my blobby figures that are plopped into them um, are put into, you know, it's a lot of times with paintings, what is the function of the landscape? Sometimes it's just a placeholder where you just put objects and put people into the landscape. Um, I like to look at a lot of the landscapes in my images and compare them to this kind of surrealistic connection between early surrealist landscapes based on dreams and a lot of the early computer graphics that we saw in the late 1980s and 1990s that also had this kind of expansive surrealistic quality to them. Whoa. In my paintings, I try to situate my subjects in a similar style or environment, one which seems somewhat familiar, but also attempts to exist more in a realm, realm of reverie rather than reality. So you can see here that this almost seems like some sort of dream creature that you would find rather than something Whoa. technological. The physicality of the body itself is also quite important, and for this reason I often look at anatomical drawings for reference materials. These organic shapes are then contrasted against more mechanical marks that are consistent with what we associate with computer-generated imagery. And you can see this kind of intersection between these two here. In this portrait, the majority of the marks were not created by my hand. They were all made by a machine. So I wanted to see what it would look like if a painting was allowed left to chance and left to a machine to create by itself. And this was the result here. And you can see the turkey knife is kind of bouncing around there. Um, Job from The Lawnmower Man, his transformation is complete throughout the movie and he completely leaves his flesh and has this kind of shell of a body at the end and completely uploads his body into the internet. And a lot of my paintings are about the same idea about the uh, fragility of the human flesh itself and about a time where we're about to start uploading our brains into the internet. Um, so that is that. And now we're going on to the second portion. Now for this portion, we're going to see a series of random images. Are they timed? They're timed as well. So they're going to change every 20 seconds. Yeah. And we're going to do an experiment and see if we can come up with a presentation based on these random images. Uh, done in the Pekka Kucha style. And when I'll would we start, when would we do the present plan the presentation? There's no planning. We have to just make it up as we go. W within the 15 second minutes. We got to do it immediately. Oh. The images are oh. going to come up, and you're going to start giving. You're going to do one image. I do one image. Okay. I'll do the first image, and then you continue off where I left off with as first, soon as the next image. Starts. First, I'm spontaneously reacting, but eventually, all, I am trying to do some thinking about some kind of presentation. We can attempt that and yeah. see if it works, yes. Yes, okay. So. And how many images are, 20 again? 20 images. Oh, I like 20, that's a great number. Now the first one's gonna be white. And this will change. And I'm gonna get my first image in about 10 seconds here. And I'm gonna have to come up with something to say. How much time do I get to speak? Oh, 20 that's right. Seconds. It, it, 20 yeah. seconds. I get to, yeah, 20 seconds. It's going to show for. Should pop up here. So, this um, is an image that really reminds me about when I was younger. I used to go with my friends down by the river, believe it or not, and we would actually just be fishing down there. And we would hang out uh, down by the train tracks and down by the river. It was probably always dangerous. So, this is your image here. 
Well, the spider web really is one of those incredible designs in nature that I find quite interesting. It's a little disturbing that there's a spider in there, and I have I'm, I'm I do think I have some arachnophobia. So, I'm, but if the spider does need food. This uh, is an image of some sari. If you remember that game, sari. I think they're sorry pieces, which is, you know, it's kind of amazing that board games are something that people still even play. Like, why do we even play board games? Why don't we just, you know, all play video games together? I've, I'm seeing a, a, a rock formations in a very unusual form. I, I want to see be, through that crevice and I'm not clear about what I'm seeing, and this is disturbing, but... Um, it's not a good idea to cross fences where there's this sort of sign. However, in third grade, my band was actually called High Voltage, believe it or not, and I'm surprised nobody ever took that name of High Voltage. And I used to draw signs that said High Voltage um, on my notebook. A book out of which is pouring un water, amazing. It reminds me a little bit of the movie Por Prospero's Books, which is about Shakespeare's character of Prospero, and each book is this sacred thing that's filled with mysterious... Re and here's an old brick. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like an old brick on a shore. I'm not sure what it's doing on a shore. It looks like some alien creature and kind of makes me think about the Montauk monster, which was this monster that was washed up on the shore and nobody was sure what it was. Coins. <laughs> Coins in a jar with plants coming out of them. Is it possible for life to emerge out of, out of money and uh, gold and silver? This seems to be a parable. And yet life is... And you don't, you can finish your sentence. I like being able to cut off. Yeah. Um, this immediately makes me think of, like, what's up with everybody's putting animal heads on people? It's kind of an easy thing. Mm. However, an actual antler-headed person was something that my wife Yana did and got put into a cafe in London. What a uh, bubbly things with it, it seems like water and yet water wouldn't be so erratically shaped I think and something is this is rather disturbing even though the colors are pretty but I'm seeing a lot this tree stump kind of looks like a penis I think <laughs> and maybe that's why it was photographed because it was kind of a penis shaped tree trunk and it's kind of funny that throughout all the ages People still find uh, things like that kind of humorous. Some kind of residence, but the the squares are so the squares within squares, and then we have this uh, zigzag shape, the orange door. I'm seeing a lot of thing, things about patterns and shapes in all of these pictures. Kids are great. Everywhere in the world, kids are kind of like kids, no matter what. And it's always awesome to see a kid be so attentive and focused on little things that we often see in life, like an ant crawling across a leaf. More bubbly shapes. It reminds me of that previous one about two ones down. Bubbly, 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 bubbly. But there's this rainbow of different colors that are shaped. I like this image. And I like the way these shapes are emerging, actually. Very nice. <clears throat> this reminds me of when you took us to that one place in San Francisco where they printed the books. What was it called? Or Orion Press, I think. Orion Press. And they had all the old uh, pieces from the old way they would print. And they'd have to put all of the sentences together. Wow. This looks like a lion, but its eye seems kind of odd. Is there something wrong with it? I think it's got like a different animal for a head. Uh, oh, well, there's something odd about this juxtaposition. It's like a hamster head. Of uh, eye and head and lion. 
And flowers are pretty amazing. You know, why do we even bother painting when nature is so amazing? Why not just look at nature itself? Why do we have to put paintings on the wall and, you know, have some filter through which we look at f flowers and all these sorts of things? I'm trying to see if the numbers from 307 to 514, 315, we've got the 300s, the 400s, the 500. So, uh, must be some kind of a residency or maybe a post office, but uh, I'm definitely seeing 345. A person jumping in the mud, also something we associate with children often. But in this image, I think it's nice reminder that with all the technological gadgetry we have, there can still be found fun just by jumping into a puddle. Wow. All sorts of pictures of eyes on cards, and this is uh, rather disturbing looking. I guess it does feel what you would call surrealistic. I'm sure there are many paintings with eyes on them of of these different Max Ernst and uh, Dali and others. Uh, right. I think this is the last image, so I won't change. So, okay. that is the final image. We just did our own Pekka Kucha very quickly. Yes. And it, you know, had some twists and turns. Maybe some new ideas were made. But that gives you an idea how you could maybe create a Pekka Kucha and like once an image is up there, you're kind of forced to talk about it for 20 seconds. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't become that hard to make a 6 minute and 40 presentation when you know a little bit about the images where here we didn't even know about the images right. themselves. And we still be, were able to create something. So, we just had a blitzkrieg of different presentation models. Do you think um, presentations are effective at transmitting information in a classroom? In this day and age, when you, w you got up in front of a classroom often, and you would profess, that's what professor comes from, correct? Is it? Never thought of that, but isn't that, it? It sure sounds like it to profess. You're gonna tell something, say, yeah. say something smart. I never thought of that. Okay. And a lot of people in education are now saying that the ideal of the so-called sage on the stage mm -hmm. is fading away. That there might not be a need for one person to be really smart. That you should create a community where people are interacting. So what do you think about presentations in general, in terms of communicating knowledge? Mm. You look at a lot of them. You watch a lot of them. Yes. Um, okay. And are I, they even presentations anymore? They're kind of something else, aren't they? Like a great course. Is that yeah. really a presentation, or is that a mm. class, or is that mm. a video, or is that a tutorial? Mm. Or mm -hmm. can a, could a presentation be something more, you know, open like what we just did, where mm -hmm. there was some possibility for chance or... Uh, I'm going to give a, a, a quick and short response in relating to my own thing here. Uh, I enjoyed immensely that first day of class when I would, I knew they were puzzled, I, I could anticipate they were puzzled about the word humanities. They didn't, they never heard this concept. Mm -hmm. They knew science, they heard math or something. Um, and I was, I enjoy, enjoyed the fact that I would give them a, this little introduction to the, I, I am speaking, I am professing that thing about um, the three words. And I said, there are three key words, art, human culture, and history. And you're going to hear this over and over. So you can see I'm using my own speaking style with a face-to-face -face class to try to burn that into their brain and if, not so much to memorize but to learn to use it oh now we're talking about art now we're oh we're talking about a historical event we're talking about these different kinds of things but that would take time over there and then i would love that they were going they were we were using a textbook 
and which cost a lot of money. It's a kind of a pretty textbook. That needs to end. The, yes, because I had so many other op options for well, doing it. Well, they could just it. be a PDF. There's no reason to even... Right, and I out. think the company was ready, made some adopt adaptations yeah. with a D C DVD or something like, like there's a, yeah DVD. No, but I mean like they they shouldn't cost any money. It's right, silly. right. Well, there people are there are programs to move. move I mean, right. Companies Open education uh, uh, doing that, and uh, so but there was I I felt very comfortable in a face to face class, facilitating this process that I had invented. So I, the odd thing is because I'm going to make the radical statement here that it seems it's very reactionary, that one of the jobs of higher education is to show students, expose them to people who are experts in their field and who love their field. So in a way, I'm going back with the sage on the stage is a significant figure and you're going to learn to value the study of art in some kind of discipline way and you're going to learn that through at the feet of this person <coughs> in this case brian who's very passionate and very and is skilled and things like that so one thing i'll just say this quickly watching that and it was a helpful to think if I were going to teach a humanities class again, and I might, I might soup up that exercise with the Marceau Duchamp in some way that would make make it a little more rich than they're trying to jot some words down with a pencil or pen on this sheet. Right. But I want it to be done in one in that one class period. I just want it to be we got forty, fifty minutes. I mean groups are a simple way. It just was, group group work, break yes. into groups and discuss what you see in this image. Right, and, and then, then they get and, together. I don't know what I and see. And then they can oh, report back something. and things like that. And uh, yeah, but and I wanted to be done so that we're not trailing off. Well, we didn't quite finish up. I wanted that first day to be done so that the next time we meet, we kind of go from there. But you could see, I'm planning a first day of class. Yeah, and my there are lots of things going on there and like i can see that well, there the are other alternatives is always the best because everybody's hopeful and nobody has missed their six assignments yet and everybody's getting ready to go and excited and yes um but still you're facilitating i think I mean, but i'm facilitating my own creation and I'm proud right. of my creation, you can see. I'm no, thinking, I know. I'm saying it's brilliant. And that's how proud, <laughs> you know, in the sense, yes. Okay, go ahead. No, that's all I was saying. Yes. I finished my statement. Yes. So what do you think? If um, digitally, you, you have some experience with Zoom groups. And sure. Yes, yes. Things. Yeah, I've taught I, I, online and other things. Yes. But I mean, just in general with your Quaker group mm -hmm. and being in Zoom groups. How do you feel that, you know, digitally there could be an opportunity for people to learn even more because they have the they have access to that video immediately. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? When you're building it into a curriculum and you're like, oh, watch, you know, six minute of David Hockney talking about um, machines being used in the creation of painting mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. like that. And before it's kind of everyone in a room it's a different type of attention you know everybody in a room where that you might have a projection and then you can play that clip is that necessarily better than a person in their living room pushing play and watching something on their phone or mm -hmm. i mean that's kind of where i think we're headed and we might be surprised that virtual learning is actually better mm -hmm. We're very obsessed with physical bodies in classrooms yes, still, yes. for some reason. Yes. You get up in front of the group. You're a real person. Very real. There's some authority. There's some, uh, you know, you have to keep, make sure people don't speak when they're not supposed to. Right, right. There's some authority that's granted to you. Yes. To control that environment. Yes. 
And now we're moving to a place where it's all just, I think it's all going to be online, really. The majority of it, not all of it. You still need spaces to do studies. You need spaces to have studios. You need physical spaces to, um, like, do experiments. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're studying chickadees in yeah. Boulder, Colorado. Yes. Yes, you may remind me of that, yes. But you probably, maybe you need a place with some beakers and a Bunsen burner. Mm -hmm. Or, you know what I mean? Yes, yes. There's, it's not like places are outlawed. But I think it's interesting where it's headed, where, what is that role when you come in and like you're saying with this, okay, do this, mm -hmm. you're, aren't you just kind of hoping that people trust you to be like, okay, Mr. Polachek said I should, uh, Dr. Polachek to you, Dr. Polachek said I should, write these things down about this image. Yes. And I think it's my turn to ask you a question, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Isn't it? I've been, mm -hmm. uh, but I, it, I, we have just, five minutes. I just want to say that my presentation was had something to do with education, a class, human, Intro to Humanities 101. I had a format for the first day of class. And I think because of the whole business of assessment and course objectives I'm much more fascinated with what was I trying to do with it right. I love that question and most of my colleagues they didn't like thinking about that and it, yet it was a pleasure for me to think about what was I really trying to accomplish by having them one person I it's kind of a uh what would you even call it like a not religious but it's like a personal view you're trying to convert people on in a way a personal convert them to well that your life can be more fulfilling if you just pay attention to poetry yeah i mean isn't that part I, of the I, excitement I think, of why you want to teach people stuff is yeah, that you're like I it's not like a religious view but I you know think, what i'm saying i like, think the university every school in america should be able to answer say that the reason they're taking painting for non-majors or taking this humanities class is because they're going they are going to i we're not just going to use the word appreciate or enrich but you, we want the university wants them to value the f study of humanities, and that that includes if you go to a movie, and then you fee and your friends start talking about it. Now you're doing something intellectually about evaluation, or maybe you're putting it in historical context, or you're saying, you know, that was. I don't think that was, a, I think that's Quentin Tarantino's worst film. You're actually developing right. observations and ideas there. And you can do that in a lot of different ways, but that's, it has value. So yes. And that, so let me ask you a question. My focus was on school. What were we doing with that? You weren't teaching something, were you? We were creating a what were what were what 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 were we Which doing? Which one? So the uh, first pre the to Pecha Kuka Wakas. Pecha Kucha. Pecha Kucha. Pecha Kucha. Mine was so obviously about school. Mine that's a presentation method that's pretty standard. Twenty seconds, twenty slides. So I did a my own one and then we did one together and played with the medium. And see, I saw what could happen with it. Uh, in what way was the first Pekka Chukucha a present? It was... Um, that was my image, my paintings. Some of them were. Yeah, but that was a real presentation about my paintings. Oh, okay. So you, would you ever give that presentation to, who would you give that to? If I had a Pekka Kucha, there's my Pekka Kucha. It's about Lawnmower Man in my paintings. Oh, nah. what was that? My glass of wine. Oh, no. There wasn't much in it. Uh -oh. uh, so you're thinking of the, that, that the 20 is a way of giving, 
a presentation. Pekka Kucha is a presentation method. 20 seconds for 20 slides. And and you would be giving it to whom? Anyone people, in the world? Yes. People have weird meetups where they do Pekka Kuchas or they are in a class where they do them. So it's a common Or method. it could be at a party, for example, with There's a group of weird people. Parties. No, I can imagine my friends, are, like the Quakers, they could decide we're going to um, flash Issue images and let each of you yeah. respond. They were kind of a fad more like 12 years ago. Okay. But it is a way but of stimulating the spontaneous reaction. They're not meant to be spontaneous. Well. Ours was spontaneous ours, ours for was. fun. Because I was playing with it. Yours was, yours, you had a tech, yours was planned. My first Pekka Kucha was planned. And the you had some notes even. Yes. The second oh. Pekka Kucha, we played with the medium so you would get familiar with it. See, I can see this in my class let's say the humanities of flashing paintings on the wall okay. and having different students just risk right so i get them beyond this business of uh, they're thinking too fast and i want them just describe what you're seeing so okay so we show them duchamp's uh new descending, new descending a stair yeah. and then this person looks at it and then says and then we go and we're listening and it's my way of trying to loosen the atmosphere in the classroom if i'm doing it on the first day yeah that i am counting everything i'm totally open to whatever you say i hate to use the phrase but there are no right or wrong answers at this point they they have to be told that right and yet there's intimidation and people bring to it their their well people are just scared to scared to and, class. yes or they're i'll say the wrong thing or whatever it is but i can see that that would be contributing to my 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 goal yeah but what did i if that if your presentation was what was i learning from that i saw uh, you, some of your paintings look extremely beautiful well i talked about my painting process and how it relates to the lawnmower man it was a common theme that came up Time yes. and time again. Yes. The idea of the virtual and the real and the, the body in disembodiment. Yes. And the, and the machines and the different machines doing things. Yes. Me using machines, Job using a lawnmower. He controls telepathically with his mind. Mm hmm. So that was a planned Pekakucha. Mm. Okay. Did I learn those things? I don't know what you mean. Well, what was, uh, you know, it was going by and I'm noticing the lawnmower man and then I'm seeing your paintings and how and pretty they looked. And I'll how... show you another Petra Kucha and then you can understand it better, perhaps. Well, <laughs> if I don't understand it, maybe am I getting any information? Am I getting... I don't know. <laughs> I mean, that would be different than if... Uh... Let me just, let's take the example when I'm 17, I'm giving that presentation to those church women about my mother's painting. Yeah. I can see now that there are some, I did a fine job of standing up there and seeming intelligent and they must have thought I was cute and I, I wasn't right. goofy. I mean, I was, I know they didn't think, oh, he's sure cute. They were saying, this is impressive, but there are other ways that that could have been done that would have been more lively, more stimulating, and less, okay, what well, she did, here's one of a buffalo or something, but yeah, if they were filmed, and more, then we, engaging, more engaging, and letting them respond, and yeah, that would be, um, yeah. We'll watch another Pekka then you can understand what they are. Well, do you want to show one now? Yes. Okay, let's do it. Um, 20 seconds, 20 slides, which is about to happen when I hit play here, right? And then we're going to try to create a story based upon oh, back this. Back and forth, back and forth.
based upon these 20 images. And it should have some kind of coherence or some kind. Okay. Do you want to start? Is this the first image? It, uh, no. No, why don't you go to the first? So here is, it's going to start in about 15 seconds and you can begin. I'm trying to remember what it was. Well, you can't remember. Just think of the story structure. That's probably better. Yeah, there's going to be a structure. There we go. Across the wasteland was a great, great tomb. It had been there for many, many years, many centuries. It looked old. But as a lot of things that looked old, like a cobweb that got torn by the wind in the uh, fence posts of the world, this tube also connected the entire planet. Meanwhile, people spent their time on frivolous activities, not paying attention to the ominousness of the tube that spread across the land, destroying the insects and the, the creatures of the, of the forest. And we had to, <laughs> sorry, and we had to crawl through these small crevices in order to find even the smallest amount of meat because the tube had sucked everything good within the world inside of it. However, the tube did attract electricity from the sky. It, lightning crashed against the tube and created terror in the hearts of people. Oh, there's still more. But there was hope. Inside of the book that our protagonist Ishmael carried with him, there was a prophecy which showed that there was a world without the tube where there was more possibilities. Yes, Ishmael was on a beach one day and there were stones all over the place and a strange brick-like shape and he thought to himself this may contain the answer that I'm looking for. But as we all know, these types of answers are always attractive to swindlers and con men who want to turn these types of things into a commodity which can be sold to the people. And these ideas were squandered. However, one day Ishmael in the forest met a being with the head of a deer's skull and that gave him new hope also new hope was coming out all over the place ishmael fell into the water on the beach and through the water he could see the sun above him slowly getting dimmer and dimmer as he fell to the depths of the ocean. His body was limp. <laughs> However, <laughs> Ishmael did spend time in the forest and there were spiders there, but they were friendly spiders. There were strange shapes of trees and many, and moss. This, this contrasted his life in the city, which was really structured and where he felt like he had to do things in a very repetitive manner that gave little value to his life and what he really wanted to achieve with his time on Earth. And one day, one of the creatures that he came across, along with these, the deer skull, a shaman was a little snail with delicate horns and he showed this to a child and the child could only see the colors present 
not even focusing on the horns of the snail. The child only saw an abstract pattern which it still didn't fully understand, but nonetheless found joy within it. Then they went to the house of the wise man. He was a man that had all the letters of the alphabet of the different languages of the world, but none of them were coordinated to say anything of truth. But the lion hamster, I don't know what type of head that is, but the lion hamster really knew the truth and could discern what was truth and what was fiction and stood for what was right in the world. Life emerged again. The creatures of the forest, the hills, the water, the ocean, Ishmael and his friend, the skullhead uh, deer and the wise man and the child too, all rejoiced. But unfortunately, they fell into a time again where they were all numbered and put back into their respective cells within different apartment building complexes. Just another name and a number on the wall. This looks so much like a taco that I get it's bothering. <laughs> the person jumping in the water the per in a puddle. But the child jumped into the water puddle. And that meant that there was, there was a new future. And the millions of the eyes across the planet could see this future collectively. And they saw that a time could exist where they would break out of their cells and live in an expansive wilderness among the lion beavers. Is that the final image? Yes. Whoa, that's coherent. So, pretty coherent. Yes. I'm glad you introduced a character. But we had a whole group of characters. Ishmael. Ishmael and the, I think the, um, the, the deer-headed deer uh, shaman or whatever it is but also played a role, yes. I don't know where they're pulling their images from on this website, but the images, you know, tend to have a certain quality to them. They're all kind of nice. I've seen other websites where they're more randomized, you know, mm -hmm. or you could do a thing where it's like Google this word. Yes. Evidence. It's a good word. You know. Yes. And then you get your images that way. Yeah. So it's like more randomized. But. So you are now clear what a pekakuche is. Yes. Uh, and one of my takeaways from that is that I'm interested in a variety of ways to communicate with people, to converse with people, to give presentations. Yeah. And I like the, and even practicing certain, what we'll call spiritual practice, whether that's a Bible readers group or the Quakers with their uh, response to a text and the Lexio or all these different kind of modes of getting a message out, including demonstrations and a sign and, and paintings and uh, and all that kind of thing that so is there a presenter that you look up to do I see any Joe Biden <laughs> presenter oh that's what an interesting thing about presenters that's great when do I see presentations except, I mean, a TV commentators and the like. Those aren't presenters. Right. Those are readers, as David Icke would say. Yes. News readers, they call them. 
have to think about that. I suppose Hannity has a shtick. Oh, yeah. Tucker Carlson has a shtick. Rachel Maddow has a shtick. Yeah. But they're not... Well, Rachel... Yeah, they are presenting a idea. And trying to back it up with images and things to support it. Yes. Let me throw a wrench in the gears, and that would be... And I'm going to go soon. I am going to make the outrageous comment, and this will make me, put me in the elitist category, but all the people who are working, getting their higher degrees, are moving in this direction. Um, ultimately, if you're going to engage in, in intellectual life, you're going to write a paper that you're going to read at a conference, and people are supposed to listen to it. And they don't necessarily have any, have, don't have any PowerPoints, and uh, they give, they do papers. And the more educated you are, the more able you're able to list, sit in there and listen for 40 minutes to Professor Gleingine uh, give a presentation, and you listen to it, and then you, and then maybe there's a little team that responds and say, well, I think I disagree with his statement on that. That is one of the the goals of intellectual life to sure. be able to do that kind of thing right yeah no I know exactly now, I mean it's an, like a real thing that happens to a bunch of people across a lot of different disciplines yes sure now I'm going to compare your world there are two things that are one the general ed young it doesn't have to be young general ed person who might be a freshman or a sophomore in college who's taking a course in humanities at a tribal college or an intro to thing or then this weird group of people who are art producers painters printmakers mm. they paint and they produce and they may teach some courses eventually and that's all this but uh, um you're the produ you're a producer, and those nineteen year let's say you're twenty. I keep referring to their age, but they're probably those general ed people in an intro course are pretty young usually. Not they wouldn't have to be. They're young, yeah. Now let me mention. Let you remember Bill DeMars? He's a, he teaches yeah. international relations at Wofford College in South Carolina, and he sent me a paper he was writing in Jan he presented in January at the International World uh, uh, International Relations Conference in Puerto Rico, San Juan. And it had to do with nuclear weapons and a focus on a Japanese Christian who was in the bombing of Nagasaki and a big RAND corporation expert in it. He said he read it and it wasn't the people weren't that impressed with it, you know. And, it, and he's going to do some more work on it, but I, he sent it to me, and I had some comments to make and all this. But there's just no escape for. I mean, when you're I mean, smart like inter, that, I think there's an entertainment aspect to speaking now. There right? is, or there could. There be. is. There already is. It's TED Talks. People are used to the format because of the internet. When they go, they're, they've seen really good people already. Mm. They're not in, you know, cut off from the world. They've watched a lot of videos on the internet of really good people. You're watching a person in Hebrew yes. talk about Hebrew, who's probably really smart <laughs> about Hebrew stuff. And, and the great courses <laughs> people wouldn't have hired him if they didn't think he had some skill and first of all, putting his information in these 25-minute blocks. And They're 25 minutes? 25 to 30, you know, and it follows it very closely. And that he was pretty clear in his speaking and uh, could do it in a way, a way that would be appropriate for a probably a sophomore-level college. It's just an introduction. Yeah. But really, those were not graduate courses there. Well, but you want them so 
anybody can be like, I should learn more Hebrew yes. or whatever. So like, Absolutely. you don't want to. You couldn't. Do I think that. the internet game is a low. You know, generally looking for low level classes. You mean like on YouTube? That being... sure. YouTube is full of them. Well, I mean, the, this is goes back to the tutorials versus yes. artist book thing as well where there's like I skipped a bunch of videos in that as well but people are actually kind of using the the format of a tutorial to create something completely new that's not mm. even a tutorial anymore so it's like what's a tutorial this is how you take off the lug nut mm -hmm. on the bottom of the blade of a yes. lawnmower yes and you could find that yes like I found how to fix that pulley thing mm -hmm. But I had no tools to fix it. Dexter, on the... Dexter was caught because we checked on the how to set up that trap, and we went yeah. to YouTube. Yes, I understand the point. And so you're saying it, and it's that's how people generally obtain a lot of how to tie a tie. One mm -hmm. of the most watched videos on YouTube of all time. Yes, that's ninety seconds. What did you mean by it was becoming something else? They, if you, well, you're talking about your friend who was getting a lackluster response yes. to his nuclear weapons policy. It's a, in the international relay. It's a paper. I'm sure would, it's a real you know paper what, that will be sent to a journal, a review journal, and there's a jury journal, whatever they're called. Right, but well, if you're smart, you have to know how to do that. And you wrote your own paper. Yeah, I had to write mine, sure. Yes. So and when you get your PhD. No. Yes. Never. Never. How can you escape? No. Of course, those people, those producers, the sculptor, the printmaker, the painter, the installation maker, who are you people? It's pretty weird.